I hope you can all see the slides that I'm just starting. My name is Merch. I, uh, I've been around the Bitcoin space for a little bit, and I work at BitGo as an engineer. And uh, Andrew Yang asked me to come join you and talk a little bit about unspent management and coin selection. And um, well, I hope that these are not completely foreign to you. So um, I'd probably start with a show of hands, which is a little more difficult here. Um, mm. But uh, assuming that not all of you know what a UTXO is, I'm going to first look at that briefly because that's the word that or vocabulary that I'm going to use most. And then after that, I hope you can follow my presentation. So what are unspent transaction outputs or UTXOs? Uh, when you receive Bitcoin or actually when sen somebody sends you Bitcoin, what they're doing is they're signing over a little bit of Bitcoin to you directly. To that end, they uh, use your address, which you've provided to them. And with the address, uh, the network can, can lock the funds up for the recipient so that only the recipient can, can uh, spend them later. The value is given in an amount of Satoshis. So here we would be looking at 4 million Bitcoins roughly. And each unspent transaction output is uniquely identifiable on the network. Every single participant in the Bitcoin network tracks every piece of Bitcoin that exists, and they all identify by these weird strings of uh, characters. The first part of this is the transaction ID that created a piece of Bitcoin. And the second part behind the colon is which output of that transaction it was. So in this case, it is the fourth output because uh, computer scientists start counting with zero. And transaction D7FD28ABB, blah, 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 created this piece of Bitcoin. Um, you might also notice that the address here has a three, which means that it is a page script hash output. Uh, that is a bit of a, um, well, not any more uncommon format, but it was not. Uh, there when Bitcoin was created in the beginning. It's been around since 2013 or so, though. So uh, other people might have already noticed there's a witness script here. So what are we looking at? This is a page script hash rat segment output. Anyway, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about UTXOs. I might call them unspents also, um, or unspent transaction outputs. Um, that's all the same thing. And essentially what you can hear when I say that is, one piece of Bitcoin. We good so far? Excellent. I see some nods in the chat. Yep. All right. Cool. Um, so especially in the last two weeks, you might have asked yourself, how quickly do I need my transactions to confirm? Because we've had a little bit of congestion. And the thing is, that's not a trivial problem. Because when you send a transaction, you basically get a single uh, chance you you pick a fee rate and then you add your transaction to the stack of transactions that are waiting to be confirmed into the queue and uh, then other people might be adding more and more and more transaction and then there's a block found and all the transactions that are paying the most fees get included in the next block then people add transactions add transactions and some get confirmed in the next block so a lot of people think that their transaction needs to get confirmed in the next block, and they add it to the very top of the queue by paying horrendous amounts of fees. Uh, so let me explain this graph a little bit. This is from Jochen's uh, mempool tracker. Uh, on the x-axis, you see time. So this day uh, goes from, or this, this screenshot I made is a uh, day from 6 in the morning to, well, midnight. And the y-axis is the amount of data waiting to be confirmed. So this is in megabytes or actually mega virtual bytes, but let's not get into size and virtual size right now. And the colors are bands of fee rates being paid. So this dark blue down here is one to two Satoshis per byte, whereas this green here is 30 to 40 Satoshis per byte. And this yellow would be somewhere around 100 to 120 Satoshis per byte. So now you know how to read a mempool tracker. Um, 
So you have basically the choice when you send a transaction. Do I want to be in the next block? Then I pay 100 Satoshis per byte. Or I don't, don't have to be in the next block. I can wait until tomorrow. For example, I'm doing a consolidation transaction or I'm sending money to a friend that doesn't really need it urgently and trusts me that I send it to him. And I just add it for one Satoshi per byte. And then at about 11.20 p.m., it gets included in the block and uh, is confirmed. Right? So um, this is basically the choice we make every time when we send a transaction. Uh, why, why is this, uh, what does this have to do with unspent transaction management or, or anything like that? Well, if you look at the last two weeks especially, uh, you, you might see that we have some spikes here in the queue in the memory pool, as we call it. And we had up to 37 megabytes of transactions waiting uh, to get confirmed at times. So uh, if you know that there's about one megabyte of transactions per block, you'll see that 37 megabytes of transactions is almost a fifth or actually almost a fourth of a day already uh, waiting in the backlog to be included. So if you, if you want to get a transaction into the blockchain and confirmed at this point, if you just add it at the very bottom, you're already going to look at six hours at the very least for it to get confirmed, even if no other transactions get added at all during that time. So can somebody tell me what happened between 11th and 12th of March this month? Does it have to do with the price? Yeah. So um, price tumbled from like $8,000 to $5,000, even below a little bit at times. And some of our miners didn't find it uh, profitable to mine anymore, I assume, because the and instead of so something above six blocks per hour, we were now finding 4.95 blocks per hour uh, over the past seven days in average. So the block space production was reduced by one sixth. And now, even if you had the same amount of transactions in the uh, same time, uh, there's just fewer transactions getting confirmed because the blocks are coming faster. But with the price tumbling, we usually get more trading because volatility makes people want to either sell or buy. A lot of old Bitcoiners probably saying, oh, I haven't seen these prices in a while I'm buying. Some people that need money urgently might be selling. We can't getting shut out. But... A lot of people are pulling money out of exchanges and putting it into exchanges, so the transaction volume went up and the block rate went down, so we saw a bunch of congestions in the last week. Uh, often more than 15 megabytes of transactions waiting, even peaking at almost 40 megabytes. Even so, it, uh, it cleared out in most nights, except for the night of the 16th to 17th, where it just never dropped below about... Six, mega, uh, six Satoshi per byte. So why do you need UTXO management? Well, if you're a big service and you have all your Bitcoin split up in tons of tiny pieces of Bitcoin and you have to send an urgent transaction, you're going to have to pay the fee to get into the block at this rate, right? And now you might know or not know, but when you build a Bitcoin transaction, you pay for the data that you include in the transaction. And the inputs are a lot bigger than the outputs. So referencing UTXOs for being for spending them is a lot more costly than creating recipients. And if you hadn't uh, managed your UTXO pool, the, the pieces of Bitcoin in your wallet properly, you might have to spend dozens of pieces of Bitcoin to make your transaction. And that at 100 times the fees you usually would be paying, and it'll be very, very expensive. So uh, I, I basically divide UTXO management into general uh, activities. One is shaping your UTXO pool, shaping what pieces of Bitcoin you have in your wallet. And the other one is uh, optimizing how you use block space. Uh, I have a longer presentation that I gave in San Francisco at the BitDevs meetup in August last year. It's on YouTube. I went into more details on each of these here. I'm just going to skim over the, the topics, 
And then I want to say a little bit about plant selection, and then I'll be taking your questions already. So um, shaping your eulogic soap pool means uh, that you want to, have one, on one hand, consolidate. That's what I was alluding to already. When you have all your pieces of Bitcoin, or sorry, the, the value of your wallet split out into tons of tiny pieces of Bitcoin, you might need to, to spend a lot of them to create a transaction, and that'll be expensive. So you might want to do some consolidation transactions, which basically means taking a bunch of pieces of Bitcoin and sending them to yourself, consolidating them from many pieces into a single piece of Bitcoin. And then when you have to later spend it at high fees, you only have to reference a single input and it'll be a lot smaller as a transaction. On the other hand, you can have a, uh, the opposite problem that everything is in a single piece of Bitcoin and your uh, service that sends a lot of transactions, think Bitcoin exchange or brokerage. And um, when you only have one piece of Bitcoin to send a transaction, you send all your Bitcoin on the road to return to you in the change output and you, you run out of liquid funds. So what you want to do is when you uh, send a transaction, you don't want to get only one change output back but you might want to split it into multiple change outputs. So let's say you start with 50 Bitcoin, you want to spend one Bitcoin, instead of getting back a 49 Bitcoin piece, you might decide to get back a 30 Bitcoin and a 19 Bitcoin piece. And then in the next transaction, you might use your 30 Bitcoins, send one Bitcoin and split that up into two pieces again. And now you have three pieces instead of just sending from one piece and chopping off a tiny bit every time, you spread out the value over multiple pieces of Bitcoin over time, and that makes more liquid funds stay in your wallet when you send a transaction. And then there's another observation here with the amount variance. If you have uh, 10 pieces of one Bitcoin, you can only create in combination one Bitcoin, two Bitcoin, three Bitcoin, and so forth in the input set. But if you have, um, half a Bitcoin, one Bitcoin, two Bitcoin, four Bitcoin, and eight Bitcoin. Sure, not the same amount in total, but now you can combine them to very different amounts by, by taking smaller pieces and larger pieces. And even with few inputs, you can create a range of different input set sizes. So having many different amounts in your wallet is more useful than having the same amount a lot. If you have questions about that, I have slides on that too. Um, maybe, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Merch. So uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and then um, ask away. Stephen? Uh, hey, hey, Merch. Um, I think I saw Coinbase announced that they were batching transactions now, I assume, for with. Draws. Do you happen to know if that was like significant enough for the mempool that it was a noticeable improvement? I do not know exactly. Uh, I haven't looked at the impact, but <clears throat> uh, Coinbase was responsible at times for 50% of all transactions. I assume uh, by now it's not quite as much because there's more services competing for that sort of uh, services. But um, they... <clears throat> Uh, batching saves a lot of space. So if they're still on the range to 20, 10 to 30 percent or so of all transactions, yes, we very much should notice that. However, they just announced it at the same time as the price was tumbling. So maybe even though we see a significant savings from uh, them right now, um, <clears throat> they uh, might just be hidden in this uh, fewer blocks being produced and the uh, the peak of all the trading going on. Gotcha. Makes sense. Thanks. <clears throat> there is a question in chat. What does the UI look like for UTXO management? Is it on wallet side or can it be on the second layer? And that's a good question. So um, it depends on what wallet or service you're using. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I work at BitGo. Uh, if you use, for example, our web wallet, uh, the coin selection and UTXO management would happen service side at BitGo. 
we calculate the transaction for you and um, use some nifty tricks to keep the costs low. But if you're, for example, a big exchange and want to do your own coin selection, you can specify which unspends you want to use in each transaction yourself. And then you would just be interacting with our um, API. And then, of course, you, you would have all the freedoms of doing that the way you want. I, I have a question. Um, OK. So this seems like a good idea for services that are managing other people's Bitcoin. Um, but for individuals, wouldn't it hurt their privacy, all this consolidation and splitting and then reconsolidation? Yes. Um, so um, it totally depends on what sort of uh, behavior you have on the blockchain. So if you have a lot of transactions, um, you might want to keep more UTXOs. If you have very few transactions, you should probably keep 10 to 20 or so. And combining them, of course, makes it clear that they all belong to one person. Uh, also, spending them together is a common heuristic used by um, chain analysis companies that um, try to track where coins came from. Um, but privacy is a is a very complex topic, and it's it's um, like keeping them all in very many pieces might also reveal stuff about you. So. Uh, it, it all has trade-offs. So there's no clear right and wrong here. Okay. So um, what about um, mixing services like Samurai's Whirlpool? Mm -hmm. They, uh, For example, they split up uh, UTXOs into 0.01 Bitcoins. Uh, and then on the blockchain, it looks, you see them and you can't trace them back. Um, how does that, how, how would privacy be affected with uh, these UTXO management, like variants, like consolidation, splitting? Right. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just going to take this question and then yeah. go on. But, okay. Or did you want to add to it? Yeah, because I wanted to mention in, in your paper, you, you focus on privacy, but you don't mention coin join. Mm, no, I actually, well, my master thesis actually only briefly touched privacy. I, uh, I didn't have time to get too much into it, but um, coin joins are an interesting concept, also pay join and, and mixing. Um, there is a great write-up by Chris Belcher on the Bitcoin Wiki. It's um, like a three-foot uh, article on privacy that I can recommend. Um, I, I think we'll link it in the chat, or maybe Andrew Yang can, can post it in the chat, you know about it, right? Okay. Yep, um, I'm looking right. it up right now. <clears throat> Sorry, what? Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to continue. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up right now, and I'll drop it in. Oh, thanks. So uh, the other part of um, coin selection, uh, sorry, UTXO management is optimizing which block, how much block space you use to, to make your transactions. And somebody already mentioned it. Ugh, sorry. <clears throat> Um, okay, some some people already mentioned it. Batching uh, has a significant uh, impact here because sending a single recipient money in a transaction means that you have to create an input set, often send back change to yourself for the, for sending to one recipient. But if you send to five recipients at the same time, you <clears throat> only have to collect one input set, which might be a little larger, but not five input sets large, and only have to send back a single change amount to yourself. So batching multiple payments into a single transaction can uh, significantly reduce the, um, the footprint of your transactions on the blockchain. Uh, David Harding wrote a great article on that uh, where he calculates that you can save up to 80% in fees that way. Um, <clears throat> change avoidance is something that I covered in my master thesis a lot for people that read it. Um, basically, the idea is you try to set, find an input set that matches the recipient amount exactly, and then you don't have to send change back to yourself. So there's no link back to your own wallet, which improves privacy, 
which makes your transaction smaller. And um, you don't have any liquid funds in excess of what you want to send to recipients leaving your wallet. So there's no unconfirmed funds in flight going back to yourself. And that can save you 10 to 15% or so if you have a large wallet. Uh, we've worked with a Bitcoin exchange last year a lot, and um, they switched to a different uh, coin selection paradigm, and that saved them, yeah, uh, a lot of money. <clears throat> and it consolidated their... their very large UTXO set to a, sorry, UTXO pool to much fewer pieces of Bitcoin. Uh, then you, I can recommend using SegWit because it'll just make your transactions a lot smaller. And then I'll get to the last part, which is coin selection. So <clears throat> naively, you might think, um, I'll just use the largest piece of Bitcoin every time I create a transaction and then send my um, send a transaction to my recipients and it'll always work with the smallest possible inputs because I'm taking the largest pieces of Bitcoin. Does anybody have an idea why that's not optimal? When you when you say largest pieces of Bitcoin, do you mean by uh, size of the transaction? <clears throat> No, I'm, I mean by amount. By amount. <coughs> well, yeah, I guess it's because uh, just because you have 10 Bitcoin in a in a UTXO, that doesn't mean the fee will be greater or larger. It's not the amount that dictates the fee. It's the size of the transaction. So that's, that's more of a pro argument here. Does somebody have a contra argument? Could you, could you restate the question one more time? Okay, so why, why would I not want to always just use largest first selection? Why would I not always want to spend the biggest pieces, uh, the most valuable pieces of Bitcoin from my wallet? Or, yeah. Okay, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one then. Um, back when I wrote my master thesis, uh, that was actually the behavior that a bunch of big, Bitcoin services were using. And the problem that it leads to is they never spend their small pieces of Bitcoin ever. And they just keep taking the biggest pieces and grinding them down to dust. And uh, especially a prevalent um, a British company was using that. And they uh, were probably responsible for millions of pieces of Bitcoin at a time when the whole UTXO set had maybe 40 million, they, they might have been responsible for five to 10 million of those, just by splitting up their most valuable pieces of Bitcoin to smaller and ever smaller pieces and never consolidating their tiny pieces. And then what happened was the fees speak, uh, spiked in end of 2017 and people that sat on all these dust outputs they were paying horrendous fees to get their transactions through because they only had small pieces of Bitcoin left. So um, let's say you have four pieces of Bitcoin. One is one Bitcoin, two of two Bitcoin, and four, uh, one of four Bitcoin. And you're trying to send three Bitcoins from the set of inputs. Um, <clears throat> some possible input sets would be to combine the one Bitcoin and the two Bitcoin to three Bitcoin, the, um, maybe just randomly select two times two Bitcoin, which is also sufficient to, of course, create a recipient output of three Bitcoin, and then to just pick the four Bitcoin. Um, some advantages of why you might want, so, so coin selection is basically the question, which input set do I want to use in order to create a transaction? That That's the core question of coin selection. And, um, the idea here is if I use the one plus two, I avoid change because I just create the recipient output of three Bitcoin and nothing goes back to myself. So I send the perfect amount of funds out of my wallet. I pay fees for two inputs, but no change output. And I have no liquid funds uh, in flight. And I don't have the chain analysis problem where a change output goes back to my wallet, which links future transactions to this one. 
And I might want to do that, for example, at low fees, because then it doesn't hurt me to spend two inputs too much. And I, I want to prioritize the privacy wins and having the liquid funds. However, at high fees, I might want to uh, spend the, the four Bitcoin because now I have only one input and inputs are expensive. So I save the second input and rather pay for a change output going back to my wallet at that time. And this one is just the poorest choice out of these three because I get the worst of both worlds. I have to pay for two inputs. I also have to pay for a change output. And I send too much funds out of my wallet. One Bitcoin goes back to my wallet. And <clears throat> there's no real great benefit to that. So um, this is basically what my branch and bound algorithm does, which was the result of my master thesis. And it, it tries to find transactions without change outputs. And since then, at Bitco, we've developed a um, paradigm of coin selection where we are fee sensitive. So at high fees, we might still prefer to use one single input and uh, send a change output back in order to save fees, where we at low fees would um, prefer spending multiple inputs in order to consolidate the wallet a little bit and to save fees on the change output because the change output will have to be spent in the future, which might be at higher fees. So, One, uh, one um, question, uh, Mark. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. It sounds like what you're suggesting would kind of be against. No, well, how do you think, like, you know, coin join, when people coin join, it splits up all these UTXOs into, like, smaller ones, right? Um, um, <clears throat> I think it depends on your CoinJoin um, implementation. CoinJoin usually requires you to send in the same amounts and then to send outputs of the same amounts in order to make it hard to track which inputs belong to which outputs, right? So, yeah. for example, there is a CoinJoin group that will join 0.1 Bitcoins and you can only participate if you have an output of 0.1 Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Um, so... This is sort of rather inconvenient for large services right. that send transactions very regularly. <clears throat> um, my bread and butter is unfortunately to to look at big wallets often, so <laughs> I, I take it a little bit from that perspective. Got it. Uh, if you if you have a lot of time to craft your transactions, coin joins might be good for you, uh, but they often require also some restraints on your input set uh, before you can even join one. All right, thanks. Any more questions before I uh, come can to Can you talk about what BitGo does? Uh, I can talk a little bit about it. Could you be more concrete? Like what, what BitGo is? Uh, oh, oh, OK, sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> Wallet service provider and a um, custodian in, for digital currencies. So a lot of our customers are, for example, Bitcoin exchanges and other uh, entities that have a lot of digital currencies. And we've uh, founded a trust company, uh, a sister company to the, the main company last year that is uh, able to hold funds for um, in large institutions. So in the U.S., I believe if you hold more than 150 million U.S. dollars worth of value uh, for third parties, you're not allowed to hold the value yourself. You only administer it, and you need a custodian that actually um, ha um, ha takes custody of the funds. And we're able to do that for, for digital currencies. I have a quick question. Um, Sure thing. This, you're talking about these amounts one and two, and is that the the you're considering that is that the amount plus the fee, or do you make this decision before you add the fee estimate on? Um, I sort of cheated a little bit here. So this is supposed to be the UTXO pool of the wallet. The wallet has just these four pieces of Bitcoin, and I just basically didn't really account for the fee. 
in Realitas, uh, the fee would be um, part of the selection process. This is one thing that I uh, proposed in my master thesis. Before my master thesis, most coin selection procedures would first select the inputs, then see if they can pay for the recipient outputs and the fee from that. And if not, they try it again. So that's pretty inefficient. It turns out that when you look at the inputs, uh, depending on what the um, what the uh, locking script is to spend the funds, so if it's a SegWit or a non-SegWit output, there are different sizes. And if I know the fee rate that I want to spend that, I can calculate how big the input will be before selecting it. And if I deduct the amount of value that it'll cost to spend the input from the amount that the um, input holds, as in like the effective value of the input uh, is its, its actual nominal value minus the cost to spend it, then I can solve this problem by having accounted for the fees already on the effective values. That's something I, I introduced with my master thesis and it's, it makes the coin selection procedure a lot easier. Okay, thanks. That's, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, I also, yeah, so, it, it also seems that I think I've heard you speak before, and I think I don't know if you're going to talk about it later in this presentation. But the fact that you can, you're never going to get an exact match, but you can adjust the fees to kind of get the matches if you want, potentially. Mm -hmm. the best amount. Yeah, I, I actually took those slides out, but um, the idea there is basically uh, to get an exact match, you would have to match in the Satoshi. But if you think about how much it would cost to create a change output, uh, change output is maybe 32, 34 bytes. And at a fee rate of 10 Satoshis per byte, that's 320 or 340 Satoshis. So if you pay less than 320 Satoshis more uh, than the actual target, then you're saving money by throwing that away and, and giving it to the miners. And um, that's, that's the just little window. Sorry, what was that, Steve? Uh, could you repeat that, Steve? It looks like he's having trouble uh, with his audio. Oh, okay. Uh, that's too bad. Sorry, I think I, I, think I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. So I guess um, also, if you use a couple extra Satoshis, it's also helping your, your ranking in the pool, so that's also a plus if you aren't going to feel Exactly, ready. because the downside of not having a change output is on the other hand that you can't do a child pays for parent transaction, right? Where you would just send a child transaction that spends the change output with a very high fee in order to bump the parent that is stuck. You can't do that in the case of a transaction that doesn't have a change output. The recipient can, but you cannot as the sender, right? So it's sort of like, you, you overpay a little bit because you usually don't really hit the target by the Satoshi, but then on the other hand, your transaction can't be bumped. I see, that's, that's an interesting complication. Could you walk yeah. through why? why? Um, is it because with the change address, you still own the private key and so you can uh, perform the child pays for parent transaction? Right, to create a child pays for tra parent transaction, you need to have a output that goes to your wallet, right? So if you create a transaction that has only recipient outputs but no change output, there's nothing going to your wallet. So um, there is no output that you could use in another transaction in order to, to um, bump the fee of the parent. However, the recipients can still do this because they're receiving the recipient outputs. Um, I have uh, another question. So UTXO management, honestly, like it's, I mean, you have this whole presentation on on how to manage it and like the best practices. Um, mm -hmm. How reasonable is it for a person, like an average Bitcoin user to manage their own UTXO? And um, like, what are your thoughts on having software that automates it for these people based on certain, you know, I want to I wanna emphasize privacy more or I want to uh, emphasize um, you know, lower transaction fees more like, um, what yeah. are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's sometimes a little complicated, but you can do a lot with uh, heuristics. So, uh, for example, Bitcoin Core has had a 
a feature called coin control for a very long time, where you basically can uh, exactly select which inputs you want to use to build a transaction. Um, there's also uh, privacy-focused wallets, as mentioned before, like Wasabi and Samurai that do this more. Electrum had a private coin selection method as well as an economic uh, mode. Uh, but those two are often uh, at odds, right? You either can, can be as cheap as possible or as private as possible. Cool. All uh, right. So you, it, you, you pay more, basically. Yep. Yes, William. It, hi. Uh, hey, is it fair to say that, especially when we're talking about um, coin selection optimized for economics, this makes more sense for like institutional it's institutions that are that are transaction heavy, where like your 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 generic um, Joey neck neck is just going to it doesn't make a huge difference uh, dollars and cents at the end of the day or or, or Bitcoin Satoshi at the end of the day, but for big right. institutions it's more important. Yes, definitely. So. If you look at the average user that does maybe a transaction a month or maybe a transaction per week, um, however you slice and dice it, they'll spend a lot more time uh, if, if, they, if they were to associate a value with their own time, that would be the main cost of every Bitcoin transaction for them, right? If they take five minutes to decide exactly how they want to build their transaction and all that, that, that costs a lot more than whatever. Uh, 10 cents or 15 cents on the transaction fees, right? But if you're looking at a service, a regulated entity anyway, that if the government comes to them and says, hey, who did you send to give us your books? They they can't really, I mean, they obviously know who their customers are and who they sent to and all that, and they have to eventually uh, give up that information anyway. So for them, the trade-offs are a little different. And if you're sending about a thousand transactions per day and spending $200,000 on Bitcoin transaction fees a month, then uh, avoiding change outputs for 10 to 15% savings is a significant chunk of money. You're, you can hire a developer for that. Or if you're batching and pushing your costs down by 60 to 80% that way by sending just one transaction every 10 minutes instead of sending a transaction for every recipient, then uh, you're saving 160k a month potentially, and um, yeah, that that adds to your cost first. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure thing. All right, guys, we have time for one more question. So, who wants to go before we move to the Socratic seminar, or or do you want to wrap up your presentation too? Yeah, I have I have a wrap up slide. All um, right, let's wrap this up, and then we'll do one more question. Cool. Uh, yeah, so what I'm really looking forward to is replaced by feed becoming easier to use. But the biggest problem is that everybody seems to be tracking their transactions by TX IDs, and they get uh, rewritten and replaced by feed. I'm also super excited about Schnorr and Taproot because uh, we use two or three multisig at BitGo, and it'll be another 44.7 input fee reduction once we get Taproot. So then. And all of our inputs will start looking like all of your inputs. So <laughs> great privacy game. That's and, racist. Um, of kidding. course, as other people have mentioned before, lightning is super exciting right now. So think about your time preference. Do you need your transaction in the next uh, block, or is it enough if it's there tomorrow? Uh, you can save a lot of money if you send out lower fee rates. Uh, if you adopt protocol upgrades like SegWit and Taproot and um, just are a little more up on the curve, what's coming down the protocol pipeline, you can save a lot of money. And we're already in the next fee spike. Uh, currently, we're seeing uh, today, I think it went over 80 Satoshis per byte for transactions. So I hope you already had your unspent uh, de dusted and. Uh, have your UTXO pool clean. All right, that's for that's for me. Do you guys have uh, any questions? One one last question. Three, two, one. All right. Well, let's give uh, Merch a hand. Thank you. Oh, actually, sorry, there, there was an anonymous question still that I just saw. Mm. Oh, okay. What is batching? 
Yeah, so let's go with that. Take that one still? Yeah, let's go with that. Let's wrap up with that last question. Okay, cool. Uh, let me find my slide <laughs> on batching. Ah, there it was. All right. Um, basically, the idea is to create multiple uh, payments, or sorry, to have multiple payments in a single transaction instead of making a payment, uh, a transaction for every payment. Um, so if you send to five people, instead of creating five transactions where you pick five input sets and send five change outputs back to yourself, you create a single transaction sending to five recipients, sending a single change output back to yourself. This uh, means that you create fewer uh, unspent transaction outputs in your own wallet, which will reduce your future cost and your current cost at creating the transactions. You will use fewer inputs in total in order to raise all the money for the um, recipient out outputs. And uh, you might get a changeless transaction. And David Harding wrote a great article on that, which um, I think we can link in the chat. Cool. All right. Vivek, Vivek joined, and he is a huge fan of yours, Mark. Vivek, I'm going to give you one shot. We're going to wrap up on one question, and it's going to be yours. All right, Vivek? So do you have a question for Mark? All right, maybe. Stage yeah, he got he got a little. Vivek, scared. you're muted. Uh, Vivek, you're scared. muted. If you're trying to talk, yeah. There it is. Oh, cool, cool. Thanks for giving me the heads up. Uh, I just wanted to say I might ask a question that's already been answered. So just interrupt me if uh, if I am. But um, Mark, you're usually really good about the ETXO set and the mempool. Uh, what did you see last week when? Uh, I guess uh, we had that dump, and I, I heard. Yeah, I, I I did cover that in the first few minutes of the talk. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that was that that was my opener. And uh, basically, the half rate must have gone down because our block production uh, went down a little bit, and. Oh, the volatility costs more trading and more transaction volume. So I think the two combined uh, probably ate up all the savings that Coinbase using batching now gave us and some. So now we're seeing con um, mempool congestions. Good to see you, Vivek, though. <laughs> <laughs>